lessons are called Samson Rides Alone. Now, the theme isn't altogether Samson. The theme is also that Samson rides alone. Here he was, a national leader. And uh, this national leader had tremendous problems. So, and this is lesson number two. We are going to talk about, and then came Samson. So this will be the, the historical uh, background that produced this very remarkable person called Samson. And then our next lesson, after Samson rides alone, uh, uh, will, uh, will be Samson's first encounter. We're going to go to Gaza, uh, where Samson found that first woman. Then, uh, no, the, the first one, uh, we, we're going to go to Timnath, which is very close by here, and you will really get excited about it. Then in our second encounter, we go to Gaza, and there we, 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 we find where Samson had a very interesting uh, escapade in his life. And then from there, we go to the Valley of Sorek, which is not too far from where we are standing now, where we had his third encounter. I would say uh, these are some of the most exciting lessons that we've ever brought to you, and that we urge you uh, not to miss one of these, and that you secure the, the, total, the total group of lessons by audio, and we have them available also by video. And so in this point in time, we're gonna to talk to you about then came Samson. The man Samson was a unique person, uh, very, very unique. Uh, the likes of him has never been recorded in history, except in legend, in the, legend, in the legends of the uh, pagans, such as Hercules and Atlas. But in reality, we have never known a match for this man called uh, Samson. After 3,000 years, from Samson's time until this time, a little more than 3,000 years, this man is still known universally. In our times, <laughs> Hollywood makes movies about this man and calls it Samson and Delilah. And all the world laughs at Samson. You can live in a way that the world will laugh 3,000 years after you're here. I don't want to say it too bluntly, but you can make a jackass out of yourself. And that's for a woman and for a man. You can spoil a very beautiful life if you live recklessly and you don't live circumspectfully as God wants you to live. Not only uh, movies made of this man, but uh, strong men are called Samson. Man, he's the strongest Samson. And so we compare strength with this man, Samson. And then commercial goods are named after him, such as the Samsonite chair. And, and uh, all over this land in auditoriums, uh, they have uh, folding chairs made by Samsonite people. And then we have suitcases. And these suitcases are called Samsonite suitcases because of their strength. And, and so here's a man that 3,000 years later, the world is very conscious of him. His reputation as the world's strongest man globally, whether it's in the Orient or wherever you might go, they know about this man, Samson. That's very remarkable. A strong man could have been born in China, or could have been born in India or, or Japan, and maybe the world would never have heard of him. Here was a man born where I'm standing. His whole life was taken up within 10 miles of me here, and the whole world 3,000 years later talk about this very exciting young man. One of the most remarkable things I can tell you about him is this, that this man is named in the Bible in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the heroes of faith. Now it's difficult to put that together, but he is named there in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, what shall I say? For the time would fail me of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson listed among the heroes of faith along with David, Samuel, and the prophets. And it says of these, these all had a good report uh, through faith, and they received the, not the promise, God having provided for some better things for us that without us, uh, should, they should not be made perfect. So God remembers the amazing miracles performed in the life of Samson. They were performed, God said, by faith. 
born in him through his mother, uh, was, a, was a force and a power called faith. And through the Nazarite vow, he received supernatural strength. And this man became the strongest man who ever lived. Only his moral leadership caused hurt to his family, to his nation, and to himself. Now, when we speak about here comes Samson, let's look for a moment. After the gigantic leadership of the man called Moses, one of the greatest uh, leaders of men ever lived upon the face of the earth. From Egypt, not very far from here, uh, he brought three million people up out of that land and across the desert and into this holy land, a promised land that we're standing in here right now. And then we find that Joshua followed Moses, a mighty man and a great man. Then his companion, called Caleb, he succeeded to leadership. Now Joshua and Caleb were generals and military leaders. When they passed off the scene, Israel seemed to have no one who could remember, you know, crossing the Red Sea, coming up out of Egypt, following Moses through the desert, and their first sight of seeing this glorious land, it's still full of fruit, grapes, oranges, and all kinds of delightful things. It's still in this land. The people that lived in, in Samson's day, called the Israelites, the Israelis, they were born in the desert. They were something almost like a wild people, you know? Uh, they lived under the blistering sun of the great Sinai Desert. They'd walk through those sands. They were raw tribesmen. And when they arrived in this land here, full of beautiful trees, palm trees, coconut trees, vineyards, grass. They looked in bewilderment. It was not like the sun and the sand and the sin of that desert. Uh, so these were desert boys and desert girls, bushy headed, mean, aggressive. Any one of them could take on five or 10 of the local native people and fight them. Uh, they were lean, they were muscular, and they knew how to protect themselves, and they knew how to win wars. A very remarkable uh, group of people they were. In this new world, a new dispensation was born, really. It was called the time of the judges. So when Samson came, that's the period of time in which he came. He was the 13th judge. He was almost at the end of the time of the judges. And uh, the first of these judges began with a man named Othniel. And he came and saved Israel and from her enemies, set them free again. They were always back in bondage, you know, just like a lot of people today. Father and mother live free in the spirit, children in bondage to sin, up and down and up and down. This period of time called Judges was about like 350 years time, uh, you know, much longer than the history of the United States. So it, it wasn't a short period of time by any means. And this time of the Judges, uh, the people of Israel were ruled by one person, one man, and normally 40 years at a time, you know, 40 years. There'd be 40 years of prosperity, and then 40 years of degradation, uh, 40 years of freedom, 40 years of bondage. Nobody could remember from one generation to the next generation how to love God, serve God, live right, you know. If there's anything that we learn from history, it's that we don't learn anything. How can I teach you today not to be like Samson? To have a gift from God and lose it and spoil it. How can I teach you that? How can I teach the young people and the children today that our forefathers had a hard time in this country, that they opened the West, that they had sweat and they had blood and they had tears and that was the way they created a great nation here. No, our generation wants drugs, illicit sex, fast foods, you know, they don't have any idea what makes a country great, what makes a country stay great, what leads a country into a great future. And so that's the reason we're talking to you. Samson came to the scene at a historic moment when he was needed, when God needed him and the people needed him. 
And when he came upon the scene, uh, it, it says here uh, that that the Lord delivered them into the, this is in Judges 13 and 1, that the Lord delivered them in the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. 40 years. Because they were sinners. Because they didn't respect Jehovah. And they wouldn't live right. And they committed immoral acts and, and spiritual transgression. And God said, all right, you go in bondage again. Now that was, a, you know, the atmosphere in which this young man was raised. Uh, and at the moment he came, these Philistines from here to the coast ruled, and they ruled clear to Jerusalem, you see, and clear to Bethlehem, uh, clear to Hebron, and all through these mountains here in mountain fastness is where, is where Samson had all of his amazing, uh, amazing situations. And the Valley of Sorek, just up the, the valley right here, uh, is where he met the one that really took from him his truth and his power and, and his strength that God had delivered unto him, and that he lost it because he did not live right. What a painful experience. Uh, these emancipated people came up out of Egypt to be freed by the Lord and knew Jehovah as their God. They worshiped him at the tabernacle when his presence would overshadow the tabernacle. They had the beautiful story of their parents, of how God brought them up out of that wild wilderness of, of Sinai, and how he had brought them into this good land of fruit and milk and honey. And that these people were told that in Egypt, you know, their fathers told them they were in bondage and in slavery, but that God had brought them here for them to love him, to serve him, to walk with him, and to be God's own people. And so Samson was chosen in this period of time to be one of these spiritual leaders, also to be a political leader, also to be a moral leader, also to be an intellectual leader of this nation. And we're going to study how he used those privileges and how he used this great calling wherewith God had called him. I am amazed, I must confess this, that today, multitudes of our own people watching me right now, your parents worshiped God. Your parents loved God. But their children, at this moment, are deep in sin. They don't go to church. They don't respect God. They hardly believe in God. Honey, that's not you. That's what these lessons are all about. That shows you that those people did that a long time ago and that we're heading as a nation toward that time of depression and, and sorrow and bondage and bankruptcy that these people suffered. As I said, it's so hard to live from history. It's so hard to learn that history goes around and around and we don't seem to be learning much from it. May I emphasize the truth that all people from one generation to another generation, that if they're not careful, that we're only one generation from paganism, that we can have, a, at this time, a God-fearing generation. The next generation are pagans, and they're our own children. They're our own children. There are people living right here now that, that their, their foreparents were good Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Holiness people, and they are nothing. Or maybe they've joined up with spiritism, or maybe oriental uh, fanaticism, uh, yogaism, and, and a lot of things that have no reality, no basic spiritual reality. If it had, it would have blessed the people where they came from, India. It hasn't lifted them out of darkness. It hasn't alleviated their pains. It hasn't lifted them up. And we go after the same thing that has hurt them, rather than keeping with the thing that made our country great, that, that made us a fine people, that gave us the great luxuries of life. And so in, in Samson's day, it was the same. The leader and the people, you know, and that new generation had forgotten how God could supply their needs, how God could protect them, how God could keep them. May the modern youth of our time, in God's name, realize that we're only one generation from total destruction, that the freedoms in the, we enjoy and the luxuries we have today can all be gone in one generation, the penalty of backsliding and our God becoming angry at our, our generation can only be just 40 years, 40 years. What a generation. Now the people that were free were slaves and in bondage. Can you imagine living in the promised land 
in bondage? Well, America is the world's promised land today. Are you in bondage to drugs, uh, to alcohol, to illicit sex, to many other things that can drag you down? I hope not. I hope the one who sets you free, his name is Jesus, and that he has set you free, and that you have now become free by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Judges chapter 13, I'd like to read a verse to you. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of Jehovah, and Jehovah delivered them into the hands of the Philistines, who worship pagan idols, Dagon, the fish god. They, they because they live by the sea, most of them over here. And, and so they thought that that was their God that delivered them. And, and here the people that had the true and the living God who created the sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, and the sea, they had deserted that God not to live with him. Coming at that time was Samson. Uh, an angel appeared unto his mother and then his father and said, you're barren, but you shall conceive and bear a son, and that he will be used to deliver his people. God wants him to deliver his people. And in Judges 13, 24, it says, Manoah's wife bare a son, and they called his name Samson. The child grew, and Jehovah blessed him. There are people watching me right now that you were blessed of God in your youth. You were blessed of God in your childhood. But somewhere, You've missed the track, gotten divorced, gotten your life mixed up, separated into, into the courts, lost your property, and now today you're in a sad, miserable situation, lost your business, maybe your business is in bankruptcy, and, and you, you haven't gotten back to the God that made our country great. Now, Samson is that kind of a story. He, he came to this era here at a time of what we call spiritual and moral declension. The nation was down and he came and he had, he had the power, he had the power to bring it up. But Samson did not live to what God wanted him to do. He was what we call a Nazarite. And Moses told the people in Numbers chapter six and verse one, what a Nazarite was. He, he said, speak to the children of Israel and say unto them, when either man or woman, see, could be a Nazarite, that they shall separate themselves by the vow, which is a covenant, of the Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. You say, what did that mean? A Nazarite was four things. A Nazarite was separated unto the Lord, that's verse two. A, Na a Nazarite took no alcoholic beverage, that's verses three and four. And a Nazarite uh, did not cut their hair, that's verse five. A Nazarite did not touch, did not touch a dead body. Now spiritually, those are very significant. If you and I have a covenant with God, our covenant is based upon these same four principles that God gave Moses a long time ago. Separation unto the Lord. You cannot be great unless you're separated unto God. These stones cry out. These stones cry out, as we're gonna be showing you closer pictures of them. These stones cry out, these hills cry out and say that the people that lived here, they're not here anymore. The people that lived here desecrated this land. And, and that's because it's laying in ruins right now. These people here did not keep the divine covenant that God had called them to keep. So number one, a separation under Jehovah. Number two, no alcoholic beverage. Uh, th this, this speaks, uh, this speaks to us of the sins of the flesh. This speaks to us of going out after worldly things and, and having a dance and having a gay party. Uh, you see, that if you do that, it'll take your heart and your mind away from God. It says no cutting of the hair. This means uh, people that know God and love God are different people. They are different people. And God wants them to know they are different. And God wants them to be a, a different people and not to touch a dead, dead body had significance in, in us playing with sin that will cause death. Sins c bring death. And so a person that's really committed to God doesn't play with sin and doesn't live for the devil. He keeps himself free. So Samson in his life, I, I, I think I have to say, he actually represented the people of his time. Now I, I think I think it's true in America, that when Roosevelt was president in this country, he represented the kind of people that was here.
And I believe our present president also represents the, the condition in America today, seeking after God, reaching out for God, and believing God. I believe our, our uh, rulers very often uh, is a picture of the nation itself, morally and spiritually at that time. So S Samson, with his exciting leadership, uh, revealed to the world what Israel was doing. And the three women that came into his life, they have three different definitions of the condition of the spiritual lives of the people of that time. Samson came, but Samson was not a person that was really loved by his own people. Well, how could you love him, you know? Uh, Samson was what we call a controversial leader. Uh, he did things that were not the proper things for a president to do, or a king to do, or a judge to do. He had an opportunity to be a high person, to be a great person, to be a historic person, to take the law of Moses and expound it in every village, in every town, to teach mighty deliverance coming up out of Egypt and how God preserved them in the desert, put a cloud over them in the daytime to keep them cool, put a fire over them at night to keep them warm, rain food down from heaven and fed them for 40 years. No nation has ever known such miracle as that nation knew. And Samson knew all of this, and yet Samson lived a different kind of life from that. He misused God's sacredness and God's power. Uh, he had a personal vendetta against people who displeased him. So he spent most of his life hurting people who made him angry. And, and so that was the kind of life he lived. Uh, he ran alone like Adam did before he had a teammate. He was a robot. He loved free will and he played with it. He even played with his covenant. Now, if, if you take your spiritual covenant, you see, I have a covenant with God. When I was 17 years old, I was dying of tuberculosis and God, God spoke to me and said, if you will preach, you can live, you can live. The doctor gave me two hours to live. That's 500,000 hours ago. The doctor's been dead for several hundred years, several, several you know, thousands of years, of, uh, of hours. And here at 500,000 hours later, I'm still alive because I'm living in a covenant. And uh, people of a covenant are, are different uh, from other people. The power of a covenant is very powerful. And God wants us to live that way. So here was a man who should have been a leader and he should have led those people for at least 20 years. He was the leader of those people and God expected him to be a mighty leader. And that man did not fulfill the sacred covenant. An angel announced his birth. His birth was miraculous. He could have been a great man in history, but he played with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the mind and, and the lust of the soul and he became a loser. The winner became a loser. In a very dramatic way, I want to teach you about Samson. I want you to become very well acquainted with this person. We've laid the basic work here in our first two lessons of, of how to become acquainted with Samson. I am standing this moment in the middle of Samson territory. This is Zora, where he was born right here. Just a short way from here is Timnath, where he met the first Philistine girl. Over the way here, a few miles, maybe, maybe, maybe 10 miles, is Gaza, where he had his second encounter. And, and, and then right up the stream here is where Delilah lived. And so she was very close by. And here is a man who made history and you and I will turn back the pages of history. What I want you to do is to learn something from the life of Samson that will make you a fulfilled person and will make you pleasing unto the mighty God who created the heaven and the earth. And that you will know that in, in this man, Samson, that we have a person that can help us with the issues of life, with the problems of life, and can cause us 
to make the right decisions. I wish to bless you. Father, standing in the midst of the Holy Land, in the land of the Philistines of years and years ago, in the town where, where Samson was born, we pray, Lord, that you will bless the people that I minister to. Cause them to walk the way of truth and righteousness and victory and love. I bless you in Jesus' holy name.